A periodic table is a way of organizing the elements based on their atomic number, chemical properties, and physical properties. Modern periodic table was developed by Dmitry Mendeleev in the 19th century and has been modified and expanded over time. One of the most important features of the modern periodic table is that it shows the graduation or variation of the properties element across different periods and groups. And in this lesson, we will see how the element properties change with periods and groups and we'll discuss why. So the first, we will see the graduation of some properties of element. Then we'll discuss the chemical properties of metal and the chemical properties of non-metal. And the properties we're gonna study is the atomic size, the electronegativity, and the metallic and non-metallic property. First, the atomic size. The atomic size is determining by knowing the atomic radius of the atom. So, suppose that we, the, the atom is like a hole, so the size of atom is determined by the, the radius from the center to the outermost energy level. So, and, and we, we measure the atomic size by a unit called picometer, which is part of million of million of the meter. So the picometer equal one times 10 to the power negative 12 meter. And now the graduation of atomic size in the periodic table. We know that the atom consists of nucleus, as positive protons and around the nucleus revolve the negative electron. So the atomic size controlled by the attraction force between the nucleus and the outermost electrons. So in groups, as we go from up to down, we add complete shells. So each element increased from the previous one by complete shells eight electrons and that makes it harder for the positive nucleus to attract the electrons because the electrons rebel each other with more force than the attraction force of the positive nucleus so from top to bottom the atomic size increase but in period as we go from left to right by increasing the atomic number we increase the number of proton in nucleus and also increase the number of electrons around the nucleus. But the, the electrons are distributed around the nucleus while the protons are concentrated in the nucleus. So by increasing the atomic number, the, uh, the, the attraction force of the nucleus increase. So the nucleus attract the electrons with much attraction force and that makes the nucleus decrease in size. All you need to know is that in groups, the atomic size increase from up to down in the same group because by increasing the atomic number in the same group, the number of energy level occupied by electrons increases. So the relation between the atomic size and the atomic number in group is direct relation. But in periods, the atomic size decreases from left to right in the same period because by increasing the atomic number in the same period, the attraction force between positive nucleus and the outermost electrons increase. So the relation between the atomic size and the atomic number in periods is inverse relation. Second property is electronegativity. So the electronegativity is a the ability of the atom to attract the shared electron of the covalent bond toward itself. And each element has its own value of electronegativity. And based on the difference in electronegativity between the combined element will determine the kind of bond formed. So if the two elements have the same electronegativity, the nonpolar covalent bond will form. But if there is a slightly bigger difference between the two elements in electronegativity, 
the polar compound will form. And if the difference in electronegativity is too high, the ionic bond will form. So what is the polar compound? Okay, let's imagine we have two elements, X and Y, and they will form a covalent bond. The two of them will share electrons, and X has high electronegativity than Y, so X will attract the shared electron attracted more toward itself, and that give it a slightly negative charge, and the Y will gain a slightly positive charge. So now we have two poles, and that's why we call it a polar compound. So the polar compound is a covalent bond, or a covalent compound, in which the difference in electronegativity between its element is relatively high. And here is an example between of two polar compounds like water. So the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen in 1.4 and the ammonia, it's also a polar compound. So the difference in electronegativity between nitrogen and hydrogen is 0.9. So the water molecule is a polar compound formed by one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen. The oxygen has slightly higher electronegativity than hydrogen, so it will attract the shared electron more toward itself. And that give, give it slightly negative charge, and the hydrogen gain slightly positive charge. So now we have two balls. So water consists of combination of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. The other example is the ammonia, which consists of one nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atoms. Now, we discuss the metallic and non-metallic property. As we know that elements in the periodic table are classified into four main kinds. Metals, non-metals, metalloids, and noble gas. The metals are the element that have less than four electrons in their outermost energy level. And during the chemical reaction, the atoms of metallic element tend to lose their outermost electrons and change into positive ion to reach the electronic configuration of the nearest preceding inner gas. So as we know that sodium, for example, have 11 electrons and during the reaction it loses the outermost electrons and transform into a positive ion with 10 electrons like the preceding inner gas which is neon so the positive ion is an atom of a metallic element which lost one electrons or more during the chemical reaction and the positive ion carry a number of positive charge equal to the number of lost electrons. So if the element lost, lost one electron, it will have one positive charge. Two electrons will have two positive charge. If it lost three electrons, it will have be carry a three positive charge. Then the non-metal, they are the element which have more than four electrons in their outermost energy level. They can have five, six, or seven electrons in their outermost energy level. And during the chemical reaction, the atoms of non-metallic element tend to gain electrons and change into negative ions to reach the electronic configuration of the nearest following inert gas. So, for example, we have the fluorine, which have 17 electrons have seven electrons in their outermost energy level, and during chemical reaction, it gains one electron and change to chlorine ion with 18 electron. It will be like the following inert gas, which is argon-18. So the negative ion 
It's an atom of a non-metallic element which gained one or more electron during chemical reaction. And also, the negative ion carry a number of negative charge equal to the number of gained electrons. Then, the metalloids or semi-metals, we call them semi-metals or metalloids because they have both metals and non-metals properties. And they exist in block B. Like boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and trillium. And it's difficult to know the metalloids from their outermost electrons because the difference in the number of the electrons in their valence shell. Each one have different number of electrons in their outermost energy level. So what is the graduation of metallic and non-metallic property in the modern periodic table? First in period, each period start with a strong metal, except the first period which starts with hydrogen. And by increasing the atomic number, the metallic property decreases until we reach the metalloid. Then the non-metallic property start to appear and increase until we reach the strongest non-metal in group 17 or 7A. And each group end with a noble gas in group 18 or group 0. So, start of a period by a strongest metal, the metalloid property decreases until we reach uh, the metal property decrease until we reach the metalloid and then the non-metallic property appear and keep getting stronger until we reach the strongest metal in group 17 and end the period with a noble gas in group 18 but in group as we go from top to bottle the metallic property increase so the metallic property increases gradually as we go from top to bottom in group 1A. So we mentioned that as we increase the atomic number in group, the atomic size gets bigger. And that makes it easier for the atom to lose the outermost energy level and, became, and the, the atom became more reactive. So the metallic property increase in group because as we increase the atomic number, the atomic size increase. So the ability to lose the outermost electrons increase. So the relation between the metallic property and the atomic number in group is direct relation. But the non-metallic groups, the group which start with non-metal, the non-metallic property decrease from top to bottom due to the decrease in electronegativity value. So the non-metallic property and the atomic number in the non-metallic group have inverse relation. So let's see the experiment to understand the, the reactivity, how the, the, the metallic property increase in groups. We have lithium, sodium, and potassium. Here I'm working with some lithium metal, very difficult to cut. I've got a piece of sodium here, pretty easy to cut. And you notice when I cut through that, that the fresh sodium is very shiny compared to the rest. Let's zoom in real quick, let's see if we can really get in there. So this side will reflect a lot of light, the other sides are pretty dull. And you'll see that especially with the potassium here. I'm going to go ahead and give this kind of a half cut. So for the potassium, this is the side that's freshly cut, and you can see the dullness to the other sides compared to that one. So I'm going to go ahead and take those three, and I'm going to add them to water, and we can look at the kind of reactivity of those three alkali metals with water. So here I'm going to take the lithium and add that to the water. It's going to generate hydrogen gas and lithium hydroxide. So you're going to see a pink color develop here and then you're going to see some smoke come off and that's either lithium metal or that's lithium hydroxide coming off of there. 
maybe a little bit of liquid water. But it's not as reactive as, say, sodium, so I'm going to put sodium into the next one. And the sodium is actually probably going to ignite. So you'll see some orange flame, perhaps, or some sparks, or some shrapnel. And then the last one, I'm going to go ahead and put my two pieces of potassium in that I've cut in half. So this is less potassium than the other two in terms of amount. But you'll find that the reactivity is a little bit greater. Now that potassium there was quite, quite reactive there, but the sodium sometimes will allow hydrogen gas to build up. In this case it's not igniting, but we can try adding another piece here. And we can hope that that's going to go ahead and actually send off some shrapnel and some flame. All three produce hydrogen gas, all three produce hydroxides, there's your alkali metals. Next we're going to go ahead and do the rubidium and cesium. So we had lithium, sodium, and potassium, and the reactivity of the potassium was more than sodium and the reactivity of sodium was more than lithium. So as in group, as we go from top to bottom, the metallic property and the reactivity of element increase. Second, we'll discuss the chemical property of metals. We start by the reaction of metals with dilute acid. We have magnesium, which reacting with dilute hydrochloric acid. You heard the sound, remember that sound. Okay, so the active metals such as magnesium and zinc react with dilute acid, such as hydrochloric acid, giving a salt and a hydrogen gas, which is burned with a pop sound. Let us try to find out if metallic oxides are acidic or basic in nature. Let us do a small experiment to see this. For this we need magnesium wire, which is a metal, water, red and blue litmus paper, a petri dish, dropper, spirit lamp, matchbox, and a pair of tongs. Light the spirit lamp first. Now hold the magnesium wire with the tongs and bring the ribbon to the flame.
Observe that the magnesium burns with a bright white light. As it burns an ash like powdery substance is formed. This is magnesium oxide. Collect the powder in a petri dish and dissolve it in water. Take a drop of this solution and place it on the red and blue litmus papers. Observe the change in the color of the litmus papers. We observe that red litmus turns blue while blue litmus remains the same. What does this indicate? The oxide of magnesium is basic in nature. From this we can infer that the oxides of metals are basic in nature. When metal oxides are dissolved. So some metals such as magnesium react with oxygen and giving a metal oxide. We call them basic oxide because they turn the litmus paper into blue. So the basic oxide, they are a metallic oxide. Some of them dissolve in water forming an alkaline solution. So if the basic oxide dissolve in water, we call them alkaline solution. And the alkaline or basic because they turn the violet litmus paper into blue or the red litmus paper into blue. So why all alkalines are bases while not all bases are alkaline? All alkaline are bases because alkalines form when a base dissolve in water. But not all bases are alkalines because not all bases dissolve in water. So metals react with oxygen giving oxygen a uh, metal oxide which is basic in nature. If the basic oxide dissolve in water we call them alkaline solution. And the reaction of metal with water, we determine the reaction or the activity of the metals by the position of the metal in what we call a chemical activity series, which is a rearrangement of the metals according to their chemical activity in a descending order from the most reactive to the least reactive. So the chemical activity series is a series in which metal are arranged in a descending order according to their chemical activity. So first we have sodium and potassium. They react innocently with water and the hydrogen gas evolve which burn with a pop sound. Second, magnesium and calcium, they react very slowly with cold water. Zinc and iron react only with hot water vapor at high temperature. Silver and copper, they don't react with water. Then the chemical properties of non-metal. First, the reaction of non-metal with dilute acid. We have dilute acid, piece of copper. No reaction takes place. So the non-metal don't react with dilute acids. The carbon and oxygen reaction. So non-metal such as carbon react with oxygen giving a non-metal oxide which known as acidic oxide and acidic oxide they are non-metallic oxide dissolve in water forming an acid solution. An acid solution turns the violet or a blue litmus paper into red. To summarize the difference between basic oxide and acidic oxide so basic oxide are metal oxide they form by the reaction of metal with oxygen some of them dissolve in water 
giving alkalines and the basic or alkaline solution because they turn the litmus paper into blue. The acidic oxide, they are non-metal oxide formed by reaction of non-metal with oxygen dissolved in water give an acidic solution which turn the litmus paper into red. And notice that we have some metal oxide such as aluminium oxide they known as amorphic oxide. Amorphic means transitional or changing so they can react with acidic as a base and react with the base as acid giving salt and water. Now let's summarize the difference or the characteristics of nonmetals and metals. Nonmetals they are the element which have more than four electrons in their outermost energy levels. They tend to gain electrons and change into negative ions. They are characterized by smallest atomic sizes. They don't react with dilute acids. They react with oxygen forming acidic oxides. The metals their element which have less than four electrons in their outermost energy levels. They tend to lose electrons and change into positive ions. They are characterized by the largest atomic sizes. Some of them react with dilute acid forming salt and hydrogen gas which burn with a pop sound. They react with oxygen forming basic oxides and if the basic oxide dissolve in water we call them alkaline solution.